Am I still m- making up bullshit things? Is that, what do you does mean? that mean can we hear you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, basically. <laughs> then yes, you are still making up bullshit things. Excellent. Why, O oh people of the Noldor, he cried, why should we longer serve the jealous Valar, who cannot keep us nor even their own realm secure from their enemy? And though he be now their foe, are not they and he of one kin? Vengeance calls me hence, but even were it otherwise, I would not dwell longer in the same land with the kin of my father's slayer and of the thief of my treasure. Yet I am not the only valiant in this valiant people. And have ye not all lost your king? And what else have ye not lost, cooped here in a narrow land between the mountains and the sea? Here once was light, that the Valar begrudged to Middle-earth, but now dark levels all. Shall we mourn here, deedless for ever? a shadow folk, mist-haunting, dropping vain tears in the thankless sea? Or shall we return to our home? In Quivien and sweet ran the waters under unclouded stars, and wide lands lay about where a free people might walk. There they lie still, and await us who in our folly forsook them. Come away. Let the cowards keep the city. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Vassals of Kingsgrave. This is going to be our third uh, meeting of the Silmarillion crew for our Silmarillion reread. We have already covered the beginning of the book up through Chapter 6, so today we'll be, we will be discussing Chapter 7 through 12 of the Quintus Silmarillion, which is of the Silmarils and the Unrest of the Noldor through the Coming of Men. My name is Greg. I'm Claudius the Fool on the forums, and I am joined by three other vassals, maybe four at some point. But do you guys want to introduce yourselves? This is Brett, from White Raven on the forums. This is Shane, East Texas Direwolf on the forums. This is Matt Varley on the forums. And we might be joined by Barrick at some point. Um, if not, Matt has uh, agreed to take over his, to bear his burdens for this episode. All right, so uh, we're going to start off with Chapter 7, which is of the Silmarils and the Unrest of the Noldor. And I believe that Shane is going to be cr- recapping this one for us. That's correct. Of the Silmarils and the Unrest of the Noldor, or when shit starts to go down. <laughs> Let's see. The Elves and Fionor are in their full might. Fionor makes the Silmarils. Perhaps he had some forethought of what was to come, it's suggested, but not known. There were three great jewels in form. Their substance is unknown. There's a sequence here, some sentences in here that I wasn't going to include in my recap, but I just think they're interesting. It's kind of suggested this might be something from the end of the book because I haven't read far ahead, but it says that Fionor is waiting and that he's going to return, sort of like at the end of the world. Well, there's that debate as to do the elves come back? Is is it like strict reincarnation? Do they have a choice or do they all come back or do only some of them come back? But that's sort of like the mystery of they go to the halls of Mandos and they wait there and then they're, I think we're meant to believe that they do come back. They're reborn at some point, if, if I'm not mistaken. But not until the end, when Fionor shall return who perished ere the sun was made and sits now in the halls of awaiting and comes no more among his kin not until the sun passes and the moon falls shall it be known for what substance they were made it does say who perished ere the sun was made so i guess that means he perished he did die he does i don't know the sun is created hold you know, on we hold haven't on. read but that yet yeah, but no, but that's what it just said <laughs> no i know it's it's the weird writing style <clears throat> Yeah, but he didn't. Not yet. But but the sun hasn't been created yet. Just remember, we're supposed to be elves reading this in like a library sometime in the Third Age, let's say, on Tolarisaya. So we know what happened. We're just reading a story. So you're allowed to okay. not know that what's what's happened yet. You're a newborn okay. elfling. So you're reading this for the <laughs> first time. But there's quite a bit of the time where he foreshadows something that's to come and in the Ma- future. And then butts, butts in with his little spoilers. <laughs> but but th- those are kind of like part of the story they're telling. But there's times where he like says something from the future before it actually happens. He even does it in Lord of the Rings sometimes. But we read in these chapters when the sun and the moon are made and Fionor's still yeah. alive. That's what I'm getting at. I know. Take it up with Christopher. <laughs> okay, there we go. Some All right, Shane. Let's go. All right. The Silmarils looked like diamonds. No violence in Arda could harm them. But the crystals were just vessels for the light of the trees of Valinor. 
Even in darkness, the Silmarils shone like stars, but they also reflected light brilliantly. Varda hallowed the Silmarils so that no mortal, unclean, or evil hands could touch them without being scorched and withered. Mandors foretold the fate of Arda. Earth, sea, and air were locked within them. The heart of Fionor was bound to them. Melkor lusted for the Silmarils and schemed to get them. And he schemed and schemed and schemed. <laughs> I just love the way Tolkien describes the way he sowed lies and discontent. Long was he at work, and slow at first, and barren was his labor. But he that sows lies in the end shall not lack of a harvest, and soon he may rest from toil and deed, while others reap and sow in his stead. Just to be clear, you're talking about Melkor here, not Feanor. Correct. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know if we said that yet. <laughs> Yeah, we're talking about Melkor. Melkor sows dissent. He suggested that the Valar were jealous of what Eldar might do and were subjugating them. Melkor reveals to the Eldar that men will come, and the Valar wanted the Eldar, or he suggests to the... Noldor. That the Valar wanted the Eldar out of the way so that they could influence men who were weaker than the firstborn, and that the men would inherit Middle Earth. So peace in Valinor was poisoned. Many Eldor forgot that their knowledge came from the Valor. Many, including Fionor, began to want to live without the Valor looking over their shoulders. Fionor wore the Silmarils on occasion, such at feasts, but he usually kept them guarded and began to hoard them and only showed them to his father and sons. Fionor forgot that he did not create the light within them. Melkor creates descent between Fionor and Fingolfin. Melkor saw the time was right, and he showed the Noldor how to forge weapons. They made sword, axes, and spears, and then shields, which they displayed openly. The weapons they kept guarded and hidden. The houses of Fionor and Fingolfin each thought that they were the only ones that made weapons. Fionor made a secret forge that Melkor didn't even know about, and made fell swords for himself and his sons and great helms. So, Melkor with lies brought about the end of the high days of Valinor. Fionor began to speak openly against the Valar. Fenwi, who is much more of a classic elf from the Lord of the Rings that we, uh, are familiar with, sits around not doing anything. Uh, <laughs> Finwe calls for his lords. Fingolfin gets there first and asks his father to do something about Fionor. Fionor enters fully armed and armored, and here's Fingolfin. He draws his sword on his brother and orders him away. <clears throat> Dick. Fingolfin... <laughs> well, it gets worse. Fingolfin leaves, <laughs> but Fionor follows him <laughs> and puts his sword to his breast and threatens him some more, like a douche move. Can I read his quote, that he's, th his little badass words to uh, sure. Fingolfin? See, half-brother, this is sharper than thy tongue. Try but once more to usurp my place and the love of my father, and maybe it rid the Noldor of one who seeks to be master of thralls. Yeah, he's, he's got, he's got uh, trust issues. <laughs> it's such a dick yeah. move, because Fingolfin's just like, whatever, yeah, that's fine. I'm, I'm not trying to yeah, take a replace, dude. And he's just like, no, 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 I will kill you. <laughs> Tells yeah. him to leave. He leaves and he follows him. <laughs> hey, hey, I'm not done yet. <laughs> this, like, I always like Fingolfin is always one of the the elves that I like throughout the entire story, and even this is like the first time we kind of see him as a as a character, not just like a named character. And it's like, yeah, right off the bat, it was just. <laughs> Why is he being like this? Yeah. yeah, I remember you saying on the last podcast that you don't necessarily agree with everything he does, but you understand it. And as we go along, I'm thinking this dude is just, he's like a bad guy. He's totally out of line. Uh, Fanor, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, I understand oh, yeah. it because he, he created something that no one ever, no one, well, we will get to when he actually kind of really starts to snowball, but I understand yeah, it from a creator. alert on my chat. <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> we'll save it. Uh, right. No, he's a dick. <laughs> All right. Uh, the Valar are troubled. They call Fionor to answer for his deeds. Those with knowledge or who were there are called upon also. And the part of Melkor is revealed. Tulkus leaves to lay hands upon him. I love that line. <laughs> I'm so going to wrestle that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Fionor is exiled for 12 years. Now... The way I understand it, he's not. He doesn't have to leave Valinor. He just has to leave sort of the city, right? Yeah, it's weird because they interchangeably use like Valmar, Valimar, but he has to leave the city of Valmar, which is in the land of Valinor. Right. Uh, his sons and his father go with him. They make a strong place and hoard many jewels and weapons there. Melkor was hiding because he knew Tolkos was coming for his ass. Tolkos could not find him. Melkor uh, appeared before Fionor at his, uh, their stronghold and offered to aid Fionor, but Fionor saw, saw through Melkor's lies and he shut his gates to him. And he has a nice quote there. Let's see. Page flip, page flip. <laughs> Does anybody else think that it's like Nobody says anything to Feanor about like pulling the sword out and putting it to his 
like stepbrother's breast. It's not like they're like, hey, Fano, what are you doing with the sword, man? Well, I mean, yeah. someone first have to be like, what is this thing? We've never seen this thing <laughs> well, before. Well, they're making them, so they wouldn't be surprised that th- to see it. But they, you think they'd be like, he's just carrying that out in the open at that point. Yeah. Well, I think, well, imagine- I, I, I think it's like uh, from the last uh, thing we did, number two, where it's like – Melkor was like, oh, you might need, like, swords and armor and shit. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and then they started making them. But they only, like, I liked how they all hid their swords. They're like, yeah, we got these awesome shields, but, like, I'm the only guy who knows a sword. And, like, every every elf in his house has got a sword, but he thinks he's the only guy with a sword. Under his bed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's just weird. He just walks out with it. Nobody's like, Feynor, what are you doing, man? He's getting, he's uh, feeling his Wheaties now. <laughs> he just thinks he's big shit. But he says to Melkor, get thee gone from my gate, thou jail crow of Mandos. And he shuts his doors in the face of Melkor. The Valar heard about Melkor addressing Fionor, and they went to catch him, but he escaped again. And those Valar need to be better on their toes. <laughs> yeah. It's like well, you think you'd have somebody watching this guy. No, but it's because Manway doesn't know evil in his heart. So it's like, oh, go on. And Melkor's like, I'll go on and teach everyone the crafts of making and corrupt their hearts. But, uh, you know. Well, he's a slow learner. And Nienna's just sitting on the side going, yes, I'm going to have so much to cry about. I cannot wait. And then Melkor's just sitting back like, yep, this is going to go poorly. I can see it. And he just lets it happen. That's where the elves learn their uh, business. (laughs) Yeah. I do appreciate Fionor's... uh, I guess his, uh, what do I think, not desire, but his uh, initiative, I suppose. At least he does something. Yeah, (laughs) Fionor's a dick, but, like, he deserves to be a dick. It's not like one of those people that are, like, just, like, pompous and can't back it up. Yeah, well, I don't, yeah, if you are awesome, you know, you can be a jerk, but that doesn't mean you can do whatever you want and break the law. You know what I mean? You can't draw your sword on your brother. Just I don't because know if he's calling you off for your bullshit. Yeah, it's kind of weird because this is like the first time that any of this kind of stuff is happening. So it's kind of like they, it has to happen, and then they have to make rules. And you know, after yeah. the fact, like any if there's a rule for something, it's because someone tried to do yeah, it. Yeah, it's like tried to break uh, it. no one murdered anyone ever yet, so murder is bad. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, no one assaulted anyone yet. Assault is bad. <laughs> <laughs> Ariel Bereskil Faniel, Sidivren Penamiriel lo Menel Aglar Elenath, Nahayred Palandiriel lo Galas Remmin Enorath, Fanuilos Lelinathon, Nevaya Si Nevayaron. All right, uh, now we're going to discuss Chapter 8 of The Darkening of Eleanor, and this is actually a separate recording. I'm joined by Matthew, and so you won't hear Shane, Matt, or Brett on this chapter, but they'll be back to discuss Chapter 9. So I just want to introduce yourself, Matthew, and do your summary. Uh, hi, so uh, it's it's uh, Barrick, Matthew, for, for those who, who listened before. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'll be talking about uh, Chapter 8 uh, of The Darkening of Eleanor, uh, which starts with uh, Melkor fleeing Valinor and going into the south of Amman, to the land of uh, Avatar, uh, where Ungolian, the spider, lives. Uh, he convinces her to go with him to uh, Valinor and do some evil, which we have, which we don't know necessarily what what he wants to do at, at first. Um, but he promises her to give her everything that he that they find. He promises her that he will give her something with both hands. So it's like uh, he, he makes her a big promise about uh, about the fact that. Um, she's going to get something out of it because she's not actually quite sure. The thing is that we we are only introduced to her now. Because, I mean, it's not really clear if she's a Maya or not. Yeah, I was uh, going to ask you that. Like, because it says yeah. that she was she came from the void, and yeah. you know, Melkor corrupted her to his cause, or to his service. But are you yeah, assuming she's that she's a Maya and she just took the you know, or she's something else, something new that we haven't dealt with before? No, no, she she. I mean, it, it's it's. I I think it's not it's not clear, but but I think it's purposefully not clear because then at least it it leaves the door open for, you know, Tolkien's world to be a bit more expansive. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the, the assumption is that she is a Maya because those were the only beings alive, except for the uh, Vala, of course. The, the closest analogy that I could find probably is that she's uh, maybe reminiscent of, of chaos, you know, mm-hmm. the, uh, the darkness um, that was before everything else was. But then again, that would uh, contradict the fact that she, 
uh, Malco was able to seduce her because then that would mean that she's a, a force much older than himself, right? Right. I mean, they all they all came from the void down into yeah. Arda, so it's, it's yeah. But uh, also, I found it weird that you know there's a giant spider hanging out in heaven. Yeah. <laughs> or that's like, I mean, you're you're meant to believe that. I guess the blessed realm wasn't like completely, I guess, hallowed at this point. Like it was still yeah. unformed. But you know, there's just exactly. this little mountain region in the south where there's evil, this this unspeakable evil being is hanging out a couple hundred yeah. miles from 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 heaven, from the city it's of the right. gods. Cockroaches <laughs> and and spiders crawling everywhere. <clears throat> yeah. And, they never, uh, and you know, it's it's actually fairly interesting that um she quit sort of. Maybe she's she's sort of a she wants to be an independent uh, spirit you know it's oddly enough like even though we don't only see her for this one chapter she has a lot of personality I, I find in in this one chapter yeah then she echoes all the way down to Lord of the Rings with I mean with the, sp- the giant spiders and the in Mirkwood and with uh, you know uh, yeah, Shelob yeah, and uh, her descendants actually which is yeah weird. Uh, and <laughs> it's no spoiler that we won't know where she'll end up right by the chapter it just says that you know by, because she's always hungry that by, at some point she she was starving and so she ate up uh, ate herself yeah in that sense, it's also like, I mean, it's a lot of, it, it harks back to, to northern mythology as well, I think, because you have the Midgard serpent, which is supposed to sort of reach around the world, and then when it sort of eats its, uh, I, I think when it eats its tail or something like that, it will, the world will end, I think. You know, it, it, it's, it seems like there's a lot of creation myth going into um, Ungoyan because she's sort of, she just pops out of nowhere. So he convinces her to come with him, and she creates the Unlight, which is... Sort of, not, it's 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 and then it specifically says that it's not the absence of light, but it's a thing of maybe even an identity. Like it's it's a it's a, a living being, sort of darkness manif- manifest, and so that is meant to hide them both. They manage to go back to Valinor, like the Vala and and the elves. They 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 all have a big feast uh, because they they want to celebrate the fact that uh, <laughs> Melko has gone, at least they want to They want to be able to, to sort of take advantage of the fact that there's a little bit of peace now and so Feano is there as well And You'd think yeah. they'd know by this point that you know if you're going to have a feast and a festival that something bad's going to go down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you should probably not gather everyone, like just leave a few guards at the yeah. outskirts of your kingdom and then you, you can, maybe but at the same time it's like, you know, it's 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 more about like, you, who, who are you going to uh, or Melkor still by this point mm-hmm. and so, you know, so you don't know exactly, uh, I mean you can't, you can't protect yourself from from that kind of yeah uh, for us, I guess. So yeah, they uh, sort of look down on it, and and they see the two trees, and so so they they go to the trees, and they and so when the when the trees ming, uh, mingled, and Melkor and Ungoliant sort of come to uh, Ezelohar where they where they are, he wounds them with his spear, and yeah, Ungoliant is sort of licking up because she ha- she has sort of like a like a trunk, uh, which is weird because she looks like a, she's meant to be a spider, but she has like the, the, the you know, like a beak. Like Spiders have those kind of beaks. Like Shalob had a little beak, you know. So yeah, yeah. She, it's... she's like. I mean, she reminded me when I read it. She reminded me like a, of a of a fly or something like that, maybe. Mm-hmm. Because in in the German version, it says like she has like a like a like a trunk, like a like an elephant or something. It's like I hope she doesn't have an it's, elephant because that just makes it more terrifying. But <laughs> no, no, it says that it's because she's licking it up, so it's just sort of like uh, I don't know. I think um, that's more metaphor, you know. Just uh, yeah. like anytime Tolkien gets, we've talked about it, Bob, in specifics yeah. about science, and it's like. Just take it for what it is. Don't don't pay. Don't go too deep yeah, into it. Yeah. <laughs> this is not a science report. So yeah, she she uh, licks up the blood of the trees and she she drinks Vada's. Oh, what do you, what, vats. What do you say? I think they put yeah. them in vats. The the light vats. that was yes. like the extra light that was just hanging out there. German version. They they, they say it's it's like wells. They, they, yeah, you know, that's usually how they're represented. And she empties them as well. And so she she grows so fierce and and terrifying that even Melko is sort of afraid. And which is kind of interesting because. I mean, we have this this almighty force of evil that's behind everything, and but due to the fact that he sort of gives her some of his power, and because he disperses it uh, over all his evil minions, right? Yeah, so we talk about that later, where it says the, yeah. the more evil he puts into his creations, the more he. I don't think he gets weaker, but he. They say he becomes more bound to the world, and I yeah. think it's after this chapter that he. They say he never again changes his physical form. He's always kind of yeah, stuck yeah. as like a dark lord. Terrible but that's to also behold. why I mean he still can change his form when he meets her right right but not uh, after this then well, afterwards when when you know when they have done their evil deed um it's it sort of it sort of says that he he, he will be stuck in that form for forever basically yeah. because uh he, he's sort of spent his force mm-hmm. you know but at the same time that means he's he's actually by making himself weaker he's made himself stronger because he has tied his his 
uh, his nature to the to the whole world, right? So he's he's sort of ethereal in in a in a different way, right? He can't you can't actually get rid of him entirely, right? Uh, and it's interesting to me that he was sort of afraid of of her because that says a lot about her. Well, so. you you get it a couple times. You know you know that you know he's the most powerful of the Valar, but at the same time he's terrified of Tulkas. So it seems like some of them, some of the Valar have specific yeah, areas where they can kind of overpower a, others. You know, a lot of self confidence issues, right? It's, yeah, he's, he's not really <laughs> convinced of his own power. Um, and so yeah, so the the trees they're dying basically, and um, darkness comes over Valinor. But the the darkness, obviously, as I said. Is, is sort of not a destruction of light, but is um, actually a, a malicious force that that s- seems like a being. It's in itself, right? Yeah, we kind of compared it to because uh, he goes out of his way to say that it's not just the absence of light; it, there's something else. So we thought of like an evil black hole, like because it actually sucks in not yeah. physically; it doesn't suck in like you know physical matter, no. but it just almost takes everything. Like I don't know, like it's it sucking absorbs. the air; it absorbs yeah. everything. Yeah, which is which is uh, actually quite frightening when you think about. Oh it, yeah, it's you pretty. You scary. wouldn't know how to get rid of it, and, right? Uh, well, yeah. even you know when the Valar can't even get through. It that you know it's it's pretty it's pretty terrifying and i can imagine what the elves were thinking just to, like but, what the hell's going on the thing is that ferno is supposed to come there and he i mean he doesn't actually apologize i mean he just just takes finger off his hand right and he sort of shakes it but he doesn't act does all the talking which is which is actually really important when you think about you know what Fionn's character is yeah we, we I mean we discussed it on the main discussion about how yeah. Fingolfin almost goes out of his way to like you know yeah. offer peace and give him a bridge to but Feanor just he's 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 a dick and he just keeps he, yeah. he's not yeah. likable and he, we don't I understand I always understand where he's right. coming from but he's just completely unreasonable and yeah. I like there's the line where they say that power that Feanor was the most most uh, you know powerful and yeah, the most power of reason I was like what are you talking about he's not re- reasonable or an yeah. understanding they said he's the most most under, you know, most power of understanding. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's also because he. Ha- I mean, I think it, it comes down to passion, basically. Mm-hmm. Well, that's his fiery spirit. You know, it's yeah, it's all and, bound it, in that. And that's why I think it's when 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 they say that you know he he sort of he, it burns with a with a with a heat that you know it's it's um so it's so intense that you know that everyone can feel it. It's it's, it's sort of I I guess that he's. Uh, I mean, he, he's like the artist who cares too much. I guess mm-hmm. he's he's probably too too tied to his own to his own work. His work says something about himself, and so he sees the reflection of himself in whatever he creates. So basically, he um, wants to. I mean, make sure that he he's uh, he has he also has an ego complex, right? He also has like no, his, definitely these self doubts. Um, and I mean, especially because uh, it's his half brother, right? So it's not actually well. Uh, that's it. It all comes from a misunderstanding. Understanding from the first time where he walks in and he sees Fingolfin talking to Finway, he his brain automatically goes, "This guy's trying to usurp me." But from everything we learn of Fingolfin, he's actually a pretty stand-up guy, and he's like, "No, I'm really just here to to support yeah. you." But he just can't he's, believe that. He's even vouching for Fear no, on multiple occasions, right? Well, he's, he's he says it here. He goes, "You know, half brother in blood, full brother in heart will I be. Thou shalt lead, and I will follow. May no new grief divide us." And Feanor's like, "All right, okay, fine." But still, he's he he yeah, never accepts him fully. He doesn't know what to say because he doesn't think maybe that he has to apologize for anything. Really. Fe- Feanor doesn't know how to love. <laughs> no, he doesn't. Well, he, he knows how to love himself. And, and, what, and what yes, the things of, of thy but, hands. Yeah. yeah, Which is also, I mean, I, I guess that means that, you know, because the Elves were supposed, I mean, uh, Valino was supposedly a land where, where no evil could, could uh, ever enter and, and thrive and so on. Well, but, except um, for giant when spiders. When you think about it, Malko actually just, what he does is he just tells him, tells him lies. Yeah. But these, I mean, he, he sort of acts on those by his own accord, right? He's sort of uh, choosing to believe whatever he's been told without well, actually... because everything Melkor tells him has a grain of truth in it, and he just warps it. He's not yeah. just making stuff up. Like, they know that men are, they know that men are coming, and I would assume... I try to, you know, think of it realistically. Like, if you're the first created sentient species, and then the gods tell you, hey, this other sentient species is going to come along, but, yeah. you know, and then you're, you're going to be worried, you know, unless you're a yeah. complete zealot and you believe everything the gods tell you, that it'll be fine. But, yeah, so so darkness comes on Valinor, and, and Manuel sort of knows that um, it's Melkor's work, and Oroman Tulkas 
uh, try to to catch Mirko, but but they are but Mer- but Turkas is caught in a, in one of uh, in a dark in a net in a net of darkness, uh, I think, and um, yeah, they they are unable to find him, and so his it's sort of like Mirko's plan succeeds. Yeah, um, Turkas can't and, wrestle the darkness, so he's 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 completely baffled as to what he can do. Yeah, but yeah, that, that's that's the uh, sort of I, I guess that's that's sort of the broad. No, that's 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 what we want. That's pretty much what happens. Mm-hmm. Um, the only little thing I want to mention is that the Tilleri were the only sort of group of the elves that, that were not at the at the oh. at the party. So they actually did see like this cloud of of darkness passing over, and they were all freaked yeah. out, and they and they hid. And uh, so it just mm-hmm. goes with the theme of the Tilleri never <laughs> never doing what the other elves are doing. They're just hanging out doing their own thing. But I also think it's it's a sort of um, I, I I guess uh, Marco is sort of uh, a gambler because he he sort of. Um, Promises Ongoliant whatever she demands, right? Whatever she wants, right? Uh, and he promises to give it to her with both hands. And so, I mean, he didn't. I mean, at the at, at the end of the day, he didn't really think this through, right? Because if he takes a Silmaril, he has to sort of bank on the fact that she's not going to notice that he's holding them and in some way because she's going to hold him too to his to his word. Yeah. <laughs> because you know they're both really devious. So I, I guess, but at, at the same time, like she she has the moral high ground here. I guess later in, in the in the next chapter, I guess you know he he gave he sort of gave his word and so she's just telling him you know uh, you you told me that i could have whatever i wanted so give it to me yeah well because he spoke literally and she took him at his word but that's also because in uh they, they i mean there's there's also um uh it says in the book in the book at least in the in a german ver- in the german version you can sort of like it's, it's an image created like the 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 big fish eat, uh get you know catching the small one mm-hmm. so but you don't know who is the bigger fish in that moment and right. later you find that you know if she if she can sort of play on the words that he used then then she's going to be the bigger fish and she actually literally is bigger than he is at yeah. that point. <laughs> so yeah it's it's actually you know i i, I think he he sort of that's that's also something he doesn't plan ahead too much i think he, he sort of just uh, does things because you know he, he that that's also what what is said right he doesn't he just hates um, the older beauty and, and everything he's sort of impulsive in what he does and in the same thing is is fair no and this, that's why I sort of see it like they they sort of deserve each other every, all yeah. three of them <laughs> but uh, it's yeah it's sad because uh, at the same time um, it's it's yeah it's it's, it's also it talks about free will you know in in a sense because Fierno wasn't actually you know even though there is a grain of truth in what Marco says to him it it doesn't actually mean that right and uh, and Tol- Tolkien goes out of his way in describing you know Feanor's birth and his you know just the yeah. way he's put together that he's the he's the exception to the rule that most most elves are level-headed, and and he's just, the fact that you know his his body burned up his mother when she was born, and and that he, okay. he you know he can his wife can't even control him, and she can barely control his children. That that he's different, and and we know that you know when Melkor comes along, that's manifested in the fact that he picks and chooses what parts he's going to accept and what parts he's going to rebel against and and it's all because you know his his daddy you know mar- oh it's all daddy that. issues Tolkien uh, Mel- yeah. Melkor's got daddy issues and, and Feanor's got daddy issues <laughs> no that's true I mean it's just like yeah you don't don't be a dick if your father to your children you know if your if your father try to to look out for your children you know in a level handed manner um, right it's it's um at least from what we can gather now at least and, and by the end of this chapter it's it's the beginning of the end, basically, but which means that I mean there wasn't much to end actually because we didn't spend most of the most of the book in in Valinor. Right. It's, it's like, the, the real story begins with the theft of the Silmarils because that's yeah. you know, that's where the name comes from and that's what we're that's, that's the main story we're telling. Yeah, and that's what what is revealed to. I mean, it's not revealed in this chapter. Because, no, but it's it's come it's oh, coming up. Nahired Palandiriel lo Galas Rem in Enorath, Fanuilos, Lelinathon, Nevaya, C. Nevayaron. So now All let's right. get back to a very critical and prepared discussion for Chapter 9 of the Flight of the Noldor. Matt? Yeah, okay. So this is big time. Melkor kills the trees, and the Valor asks Feanor to give up the light of the Simmerals to, like, revive the trees. 
And he's like, well, I can't really do that. And he's like, yeah, you can't. You don't know what you really ask of him. Because Feyenoord's like, well, yeah, you gave into your life so much power. The same thing I gave into the Simmerals, and it will really destroy me. And Oli says, yeah, I understand. And Would it destroy him? or? Because I just got the impression that he wouldn't be able to recreate it, and he coveted him. Well, so, I mean, really... I mean, destroy his soul. Feyenoord Fe- Fe- says, I will be the first one to die because if I give up the Simmerals, like, okay. that's it. And Mando says, uh, not the first. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and so it turns out that Melkor attacked uh, Feyenoord's home, killed his father, stole all the jewels, including the Simmerals. So... Uh, Morgoth and Golian go to the north where was it? Hell Caraxes? Hell Caraxa. Yeah. That's a good word. Um, yeah. And Melkor had said that he would give Golian everything he had with two hands. And so he fed this huge giant spider all the jewels that uh, Feanor and the Noldor had, and she still thirsted. And she's like, you said with both hands. And he's like, fuck you. I have the Simmerals in, like, one hand, and they're burning the shit at me like gonorrhea. And, like... Because <laughs> they're hallowed, and hallowed does yeah. nothing except burn Melkor a little bit. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, so... She's like, well, you just fucking cheated me out there. So she wound him up with the uh, shadow twine and shit like that. And he screamed so loud that the land was named Llama. And then all his Balrogs came out and ripped up her shadowy twines with their fiery whips. I'd like she to see went, that. She went to <laughs> Nan Gongarthed, otherwise known as Valley of Dreadful Death. Because she And was I said that that was an awesome name. Because Nan Gongarthed. And it's also yeah. the mountains of Arid Gorgoroth, which is the same mountains that are uh, in Mordor, the mountains of terror. Also the same uh, mountains that Baron will go through later on. Mm-hmm. Morgoth goes back to the ruins of Angban, begins to build his uh, fortress, and he sets the Simmerals into his Iron Crown, which will also be important later on. Fionor convinces the Noldor to leave Amon and return to Miller to seek the Simmerals and destroy Morgoth. Okay, so this is where the awesome speeches come on. Indeed. All right, cool. So basically, at this point, Fanor, you know, all the people of, of the Noldor are roused up because their High King was just murdered, and he's like, I'm the High King now, and we're going to get the hell out of here, and we're going to go to Middle Earth, and we're going to take the Silmarils back. And not everybody is really with him because they're not all like, hey, why are you our king? Why not Fingolfin or the other guy? Um, so Fanor is, is all riled up, and he, you know, draws his sword, and he gives this amazing speech, and it's some of the most beautiful writing in, in, in the entire book, I think. But this is my one of my probably my favorite passage, where he says, uh, "Why, O people of the Noldor, why should we longer serve the jealous Valar, who cannot keep us nor even their own realm secure from their enemy? And though he be now their foe, are not they and he of one kin? Vengeance calls me hence, but even were it otherwise, I would not dwell longer in the same land." with the kin of my father's slayer, and of the thief of my treasure. Yet I am not the only valiant of this valiant people. And have ye not all lost your king? And what else have ye not lost, cooped here in a narrow land between the mountains and the sea? Here once was light, that the Valar begrudged to Middle-earth, but now dark levels all. Shall we mourn here, deedless forever, a shadow folk mist-haunting, dropping vain tears in the thankless sea? Or shall we return to our home, in Quivienne and sweet ran the waters under unclouded stars, and wide lands lay about, where a free people might walk. There they lie still, and await us, who in our folly forsook them. Come away, let the cowards keep this city. I actually, I get chills when I when I read that. I've read this is like my fifth time through, and I, I literally break out oh, in, yeah. in goosebumps when I when I read this 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 passage. Because we know what's happening, and it's all, this is really where it starts, where he binds his people to this unfulfillable oath, basically. Oh, yeah. I get I get the point he makes right here, but for him to compare 
Melkor slash Morgoth to the other Valar, how would he feel if they compared other elves to him? Do you know what I mean? Like, he thinks he's so much better than all the other elves. Obviously, he thinks he's better than Fingolfin. If they compared him to them, he would probably be outraged. He's like, I'm better than them. And they'd be like, you see? It's kind of kind of the same here. You see, but I, I get what he's saying. Like, okay, we have these gods that say they're gods, and one of them... They're sitting on their ass. Yeah. Yeah, I completely understand that because anytime something it's like the Valor always have to stop and they're they're very measured about their responses. They never react hastily to anything. But at the same time they do there was the line a couple of chapters back at how they're they're not the masters of the Eldar, but they're more their el their elders, I believe. Or they're they're guiding them, but they're not telling them what to do. It's all suggestive and like, hey, we think we know what's best, but if you want to go do your thing, go do your thing. And I kind of like that kind of, I don't want a god that's necessarily telling me what to do and, and <laughs> telling what you can and can't do, but at this point, I wish cooler heads would have prevailed. Yeah, I feel like if we fast forward to the future and it's men saying, let's go kill them, the elves would have been like, well, let's calm down and just think about how we're going to do this. <laughs> but this time it's the elves being all like, let's just charge out there and take down Morgoth. <laughs> kind of weird how it's like the youth of their their race but i think we also have to try to keep in mind like there's nothing comparable to the sumerals like i'm trying to i mean yeah the rings of power but it, this is like a whole other thing this is like the light of creation that is in that is in these things and they're the most beautiful things anyone's ever seen they're on un, they're unbreakable and the guy who created them has just lost them and he knows he can never make them again so i, I do understand he calls it the rape of the sumerals and you know he's he works in the clever line of, and we're going to get my treasure back right in the middle of this awesome speed. You know, he buries the lead a little bit there. But, right. Uh... They, they say, uh, fair shall be the end, though long and hard shall be the road. Say farewell to bondage. Say farewell to ease. Say farewell to weak. Say farewell to treasure. More still shall we make. Journey light, but bring with you your swords. For we should go further than Arome, endure longer than Tolkis. We never turn back from pursuit after Morgoth to the ends of the earth. War shall he have and hatred undying. But when we have conquered and have regained the Cimarils, then we and we alone shall be lords of the unsullied light and the masters of bliss and beauty of Arda. No other race south just us. Oust us. Oust us? What did I say? Joust us? <laughs> Something like that. No one will joust with us because <clears throat> we don't have horses yet. Yeah, I'm but... getting kind of a weird uh, kind of Nazi turn there at the end of that. Am I the only one? But the race, no other race shall oust us and we will be lords of the earth. Well, I think that's because Melkor poured all these lies about how men are coming and men are going to take over the elves. I think that's what he's referring. I don't think he's referring to like yeah. other types of elves or a, another yeah, sect. Just, just stuck out in my head toward the end there. He kind of turned it. Like I, I kind of get it, but like I don't think it's really like a, like a complete commanding thing. They just want to destroy the evil lord, <laughs> who actually wants to be like. Yeah, if the anyone's Nazis in the story, it's, yeah. it's Melkor. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. regain the Silmarils. And doing that, they, uh, Fanor and all his sons called down an everlasting oath that would tie them together no matter what happened. So they said, Thus spoke Madros, Maglor, and Caligurum, Kurfum, Carathirn, Amrod, Amros, princes of the Noldor, and May, uh, quailed to hear the dread words. So sworn good or evil, an oath may not be broken, and it shall pursue the oath keeper and oath breaker to the ends of the world. So. Yeah. It's kind of weird that we don't actually we get like a summary of the oath, but we don't actually get in quotes him take them taking the oath. Yeah, I saw that in your notes, and I also found that weird. Like, although he made that huge speech, you don't hear the oath. Right. Maybe but, no elf ever wanted to write it down. It was so bad. Well, yeah, I mean, he named like the Valar, and that that was basically what well, made the oath. Like, he named it against the Valar and. And that's what made it so binding. This kind of reminds me of the movie Excalibur, because everybody's so dramatic in that movie. <laughs> Are you with us or against us? Against you! Oh. 
They run off and fight. But I guess, you know, like Greg said, it's, you know, the Silmarils, we don't have anything comparable. And Fionor was a hothead anyway. Well, he had a soul of fire. True. Get a Galadriel name drop. Oh, yeah. Galadriel's coming up. Oh, yeah. So she also, like, didn't take part of the curse, but she also was like, I want to go back to Mandalorian. <laughs> I'd like, like if y'all going, shit. <laughs> can I ride with y'all? Yeah, basically. She's like, eh, I mean, I don't like this at all, but I still desire Miller. Well, she desired to make a realm of her own, is what it said. It's a tyrant. Right, with uh, Kelgorm. Kel- Kelleborn. Well, they never name Kelleborn here, though, do they? No, it's Kelgorm. Kelleborn is, I think, the son of Thingol Eru. No, he he is a he's a Cinder and Elf, but I don't think he's related to uh to Thingol. Okay. Uh, well anyway, that will come. Thingol only had one come child later. and that was Luthien. Ah uh, yeah. Fair enough. So uh Manway exiles Feanor, um, but the Noldor are like allowed to stay, but Feanor says, Hey, come on all you guys, let's go. <laughs> we can create kingdoms of our own and throw down Morgoth and we don't need these people that can't even defend their own lands. Feanor says to him, say this to Manway Salumna, High King of Arda, if Feanor can't overthrow Morgoth, at least he delays not to assail him and sits not idle in grief. And it may be that Eru has set in me a greater fire that that shall know. Such hurt at least will I do to the foe of the Valar that even the mighty of the Ring of Doom shall wander here. Yea, in the end, they shall follow me. Farewell. So basically, it's just like, bitch, you're not doing doing anything. (laughs) I'm doing what you're supposed to be doing. And I mean, I guess it's kind of a spoiler, but he's kind of right in the end. He's basically calling him out. Like, dude, you're not (laughs) you're not fucking up this guy. But, but part of the reason why the Valar don't act very often is because when they do, it is incredible. Like, things just like, get destroyed when they clash. It's crazy. And that's one of the reasons why they keep sitting back, because it, too much power is let loose when they battle one another. Yeah, the land has always changed, and that's why, yeah. they, were, that's why they were wary to, to attack him in the first place, because the, they knew the elves, elves were coming sooner. They didn't want to mess that up. And they actually, like, cordoned the elves off the last time they actually had to take down Melkor, but now the elves are, like, strewn out about Beleriand. Right. And they, you know, they can't just pick them all up and say, come this way, because we're about to fight Melkor now. It's kind of tough. And plus, men should be coming sometime. The Valar know this, but the elves really don't know much about it. Yeah, so, but, I mean, they still do. They still do what? Like, fuck up the world a lot of times. <laughs> In, only Long as a goal. last resort, but let's not spoil that for the people going forward. All right, so Thanor tries to go to Teleri, that were the shipbuilders, and he tries to convince them to leave Amun and go to Middle-earth, and they're like, nope. <laughs> so Thanor talks to Olway, who was one of the guys with Finway, his father that came over to Amon. One of the originals. Yeah. He's one of the big three. Yeah, yeah, one of the big three. He's like, we renounce no friendship, but it may be part of a friend to rebook a friend's father. And when the Noldor welcomed us and gave us aid, otherwise then you spoke in the land of Amon. We were to dwell forever as brothers whose houses stand side by side. But as for our white ships, you gave us not. We learned not that craft from the Noldor, but from the Lord of the Sea, and the white timbers we wrought with our own hand, and the white sails were woven by our wives and our daughters. Therefore we will neither give them nor sell them for any league or friendship. For I say to you, Fionor, son of Fenway, these are to us as are the gems of Noldor, the works of our hearts, those like we shall never make again. So instead of like Fionor being like, oh, so these are like your Silmarils? That's pretty cool. <laughs> I understand that. All right, cool. See you later. <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> this is where it really crosses the line. Yeah, Ken saying. <laughs> 
this is like unheard of. I mean, yes, he drew a sword on his brother, his half brother, and that was like almost unforgivable. He got exiled for that, but he basically leads, he slaughters his own people in his hot headedness, and just the way this all goes down, it's just, it's a gut punch, and I, I have a tough time rooting for him, even though he's, he's. He thinks he's the hero, but uh, he just he gets everyone involved in it. His sons and everyone they have no choice but to join him in this, and it's it's brutal. Yeah, it, and it's because of the uh, oath that they all took. But what's worse is uh, Fingolfin coming on to this and seeing like, oh my god, the Teleri are like, mm. and so all his soldiers start killing the Teleri too, and he doesn't even realize why this is happening. And the Teleri don't have swords. They're fighting them with, like, oars and arrows and, like, cheap little bows. It's 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 a slaughter. Yeah, it sucks. Mm-hmm. And... <laughs> I'm sure Feanor's like, man, I'm glad we made these swords. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I mean, in the show notes, I put a picture in there that I always imagine the Doom of Mandos looking, like, similar. And he said... And they heard a, a loud voice, solemn and terrible, that bade them stand and give ear. Then all halted and stood still, and from end to end, the host of the Noldor, the voice was heard speaking the curse and prophecy, which is called the prophecy of the North and the doom of the Noldor. Much is foretold in dark words, which the Noldor understood not until the woes indeed after befell them but all heard the curse and was utter upon those that would not stay nor seek the doom and pardon of Noldor. So this is when uh, Finarfin left. This is basically after the slaughter that they're still they're, they're about to leave and this banner bearer a show you know comes up on the mountains and he's gonna he's reading that he's telling the people what it is and we're meant to believe this is mandos because there was some debate as to was it actually mandos or was it a servant of mandos but it's it's the doom of mandos and we're meant to believe that it's the valor right, himself yeah. actually showed up and he's like this is what this is this is what you've wrought you've done this on yourselves and you're gonna have to live with this now right the the, the first one was a uh vassal of mandos i was like yeah do this and fianor's like fuck you <laughs> <laughs> and after the kin slaying, Mandos comes up and he's like, uh, Tears unnumbered ye shall shed, and the valor will fence Valinor against you and shut you out, so that not even the echo of your lamentation shall pass over the mountains. On the house of Feanor, the wrath of valor lieth from the west unto the uttermost east, and upon all that will follow. Follow them, it shall be laid so. Their oath shall drive them and yet betray them and ever snatch away the very treasures that they sworn to pursue. To evil and shall all things turn, that they begin well. And by treason of kin unto kin and the fear of treason shall this come to pass. The dispossessed shall, uh, shall they be forever. This gets back to my thing about uh, Yavanna. It's like, are they proclaiming it or are they predicting it? I always thunk, wonder. Thunk. <laughs> I think what he's saying is, because you made this oath, this is what's going to happen to you. And I think he's just stating it, and he has seen it, and he does know what's going to happen. But he's not going to do anything to prevent it. He's also not being super specific. He's just it's like a fortune teller almost. Like, bad stuff's going to happen, and yeah, you're going to be on... You're gonna, lies and you know there'll be trust issues but it's yeah it's it's just showing how the oath even from the get-go it was a bad thing and, and even at the at the earliest point they're regretting it already well i don't know if they are but <laughs> Some of them are. they will well you find they are because this is when finarfin taps out and goes back home but, yeah but he didn't yeah. take the oath. i'm out yeah but they're with him i mean right, 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 we're right. only led to believe that just feanor and his sons took the oath right that's everyone else's they're not just along right. for the ride they're one people i mean they're there's only three tribes in the world of this you know in in the blessed realm and they're i guess they would feel obligated to stay to stick together yeah the, the oath only affects him and his sons but the noldor have all been banished until they prove themselves worthy Unless they seek the pardon of the... Of right, the right. That's what I mean by prove themselves worthy. Yeah, we'll see that later, but... So, yeah, Fenarfin's like, nah, we're out. But his sons, uh, Fingolfin and Fingon? Fingon? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, his sons don't 
turn back. The ships really intrigue me. Like, I want to know, like, they, they, they talk him up, like, these are some really special ships. And I can understand Silmarils, the light from the trees, their jewels. I'm like, what specifically about these sh- ships is so badass, you know? Well, the, well these are the same ships that brought them there, right? Pulled, pulled by swans. I hope they have masks. I mean, I them mean how to make ships do you think you know how they make, like, sails? Yeah, but they said, like the Silmarils, we could never, we'll never be able to make their like again. I think, mm. like, humans, they clear-cut all the white trees they made them out of, so. <laughs> Poor planning, I don't know. Uh, They're weirwood ships, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Mass faces. <laughs> Pulled it by is, ravens. It's not like these ships are white like ravens. Ma- yeah, bam. It's not like it's not like these ships are magical or anything. Like some of them don't even make it. Right, but they were created by the gods or with the help of the gods. So it's 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 almost like you know how Yvanna was involved in the Sumerals. But uh, I just the um, the doom. I just want to read the second paragraph because this is a lot of the you know he he lays it all out on the table. Oh, yeah. when they landed. No, no. Where you you read the dispossessed? Shall they ever be? The, that next paragraph is kind of puts you know seals the deal for for the Noldor. Oh yeah. Do where it. He, he says uh, you have spilled the blood of your kindred unrighteously and have stained the land of Ammon. For blood ye shall render blood, and beyond Ammon ye shall dwell in death's shadow. For though Eru appointed to you to die not in Ea, and no sickness may assail you, yet slain ye may be, and slain ye shall be, by weapon and by torment and by grief. And your houseless spirit shall come then to Mandos. There long shall ye abide and yearn for your bodies, and find little pity, though all whom ye have slain should entreat for you. And those that endure in Middle-earth, and come not to Mando, shall grow weary of the world, as with a great burden, and shall wane, and become as shadows of regret before the younger race that cometh after. The Valor have spoken. So. He's basically telling them what's going to happen to him in the Third Age. Yeah, because that's, that's basically what the uh, elves are going through at that point, and they're trying to get back to uh, to go back to Valinor. Well, but there's not actu- actually that many Noldor left in the Third Age. Well, Galadriel is one of the last. Galadriel lists. is, yeah. but that's pretty much it, isn't it? Well, that's what happens to all the elves. Right, they all dwindle, but... Dwindle the elf? <laughs> what? Okay, to finish up my long, long episode... So Fjernur takes all the sh- uh, ships after the king slaying, and he goes to Middle Earth. And then he says, But when they landed, Mahedros, the eldest of his sons, and at a time of friend of Fingon, ere Morgos lies came between, Fjernur saying, or came, uh, spoke to Feanor saying, Now what ships, rowers, will you spare to return, and whom shall they bear hither? Fingon the Valiant? Then Feanor laughed as one fain, he cried, None and none. <laughs> <laughs> what I have left behind, I count as no loss. Needless baggage on the road is proved. Let those that curse my name curse me still, and while their way back to the cages of the Valari, let their ships burn. Yeah, because he hasn't move. done enough dick moves this this chapter. Does that yeah. sound like an orc talking? Like, yeah, that sounds yeah. like something an orc would say. And then the last one is like, Fingolfin and the others were forced to turn back to the Helcaroxy. They braved the ice, and many were lost along the way. They finally arrived in Middle Earth at the first rising of the moon. And personally, I like how the moon ro- uh, rose and they blew their trumpets. Like, I don't know, it's in a chapter maybe two or three away, but it's a really, like, kind of awesome thing. Well, they've come through, like, the, we're led to believe the grinding ice is, they say that it's, it's, it's the... Uh the toughest thing to, to get through and, and it's you know many were lost along the way Turgon's wife died and yeah right it's it's this unpassable and like I pictured because Feanor basically slips out of after they take the ships he's like they sneak away from from, from Fingolfin and his host and yeah because they, they don't they, have enough ships to carry everybody right but yeah. like, it wasn't like hey we're gonna come back for you like they didn't even he just left and yeah and Fingolfin then, seems, it sees like this bright fire in the sky and he's like we're betrayed. Son of a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> Son how, of a bitch. We're going to have to walk this shit. How, how is it that they didn't have enough ships? I mean, if everybody was there, everybody came over on ships, right? Yeah, the Teleri were supposed to be the greatest of the hosts, but maybe a lot of the ships were out. They weren't all in port at the time. Oh, maybe. You can't get bogged down in the specifics. Anytime <laughs> numbers and science, we just have to like go, oh, okay, and then just keep going. <laughs> yeah, maybe they ferried, you know, 
host by host. Maybe maybe Serdan had a bunch over there still, or Kirden, whatever you call him. Maybe he still had a bunch over there just to send elves over when they wanted to go. Yeah. <laughs> but this is another thing that just endeared Fingolfin to me more because he's like, I'm, I can't go back because we just committed, you know, fratricide, and we're gonna have to go. And you know, they they went through the toughest thing, and they finally get there, and that is a really awesome, just rousing scene of them blowing their trumpets as the moon's sh- shining for the first time, and yeah. they, and they're like, I can't wait to get to Fainor. I want to bitch slap him so hard. <laughs> I just feel really bad for Fingolfin because it's all like a misunderstanding to him. Like, I know. He just came upon them fighting and he was like, oh, the Valar must have set them against us to keep us from leaving. We must protect our brethren. And he just didn't even understand. And then afterwards, like, Mandos comes down. He's like, what the fuck? Mm. Well, <laughs> my whole, no, my holes I mean, have been empty and now they're full. What happens? <laughs> the, the worst with Fingolfin is him just saying, like, I'm a brother to you, Theonor. Whatever you want to do, I'll follow you. And that's why, like, yeah, when it, when he comes on to uh, the Teleri, uh, you know, King Slaying, he's like, oh, the Teleri must have fucked him over. <laughs> I gotta go defend my brother-in-law. Let's do this. Yeah, that was a bad call off in Golfin. <laughs> he's trying to do the right thing, though. He, he, he didn't want Feanor to think that he was, because he never was trying to, to usurp him, really. He Right. It all went back to that. They just he, he heard him over to overheard him talking with Finway. And it's not like he's gonna walk up in the middle of the battle and be like, "Wait, wait, wait! Everybody, stop! Why are we fighting?" No, <laughs> you just join the fight. Hold on, what's this? <laughs> yeah, Feanor, I'm gonna say no. <laughs> this is your bad. <laughs> There's no turning back at this point for the Noldor. They've got to go through with it and hope for the best. But the fact that they burn the ships, it's like, why? What is the reasoning behind that? Don't Do think about the, the past. Got to move forward. Huh? <laughs> Because he had to move forward. Again? Did he not want his people to want to turn back? Is that why he burned them? I no, think so, yeah. So no one go back. F- F- Finrod's a dick. He's like, <laughs> oh, fuck them. Like, we don't have to bring them across. Like, I'm going to take on more growth myself. That's another thing is that it's kind of interesting about all this is how powerful they must be. I mean, these are, for lack of a better term, the gods. They're not god, but they're basically like the gods. And F- Fionor is like, I'm going to go take down that one, the one all the other gods are afraid to fight. And he more or less does. He goes, you know, he makes war against them. I won't say they're afraid to fight him. They're afraid of the outcome of the fight to the the earth. They're not really scared. I don't think they're scared of Melkor. They're not scared, well, because they're all the same, but they do know he is the most powerful of them. And like you said, if they do take him on, it's going to be, there's going to be vast consequences. Yeah. But still, I mean, could you imagine like, uh, What's the the elves in Lord of the Rings? Uh, what do you the mean? one with the blue ring, Elrond. The one with the blue ring, <laughs> Elrond. <laughs> Can you imagine Elrond like going to war against the gods? No, like, but I know uh, he's a different kind of elf. But but, but that's what like uh, Fanor's speech is all about. It's like you, I have a fire in me more than you know. And I'm gonna fucking punch this guy like really hard, <laughs> <laughs> and all my sons are also gonna fucking kick this guy's ass. And yeah, whatever you say about like it might bite it, bite us in the ass later. Yeah, whatever. We'll do more than you'll do. And that was a big thing. It was like we will fucking fight him, and you will not, and you'll just watch. And I really think that's, like, what he's saying is just, like... Well, he believes his talk. There's no doubt about that. Oh, yeah. Well, he's like, for good or bad, we're fighting this guy, and you guys are sitting on your ass. I I just feel like, how could he even... Like, he's clearly not a good fighter. I mean, he's never had to fight anybody. He lost to a Balrog. (laughs) That's just it. Does he even know... Sorry. Does does he even know... Anyway, like, his... Does he know about Balrogs? Because it's like he thinks it's just Morgoth all by himself. I don't understand why he thinks that they can take him on. And they don't even need the rest of the Noldor. They're like, fuck the ships, burn them, let's go get him. What is going on in his head? He's not it's, He's not level-headed and he's not thinking, you know, he's not thinking no. straight. <laughs> right, all he's thinking is, I want my Silmarils back. Mm-hmm. Right. And he you killed my how. father, prepare to die. <laughs> exactly. Haril the rescue von Hiel. Sidivren Penamiriel o Menel Aglarelenath, Nahairid Palandiriel o Galazrem in Enorath, 
fanuilos le linathon nevaya si nevayaron. All right, so let's move on to chapter 10, which uh, gives us a little more insight as to what's going on in Middle-earth the last you know, three ages of the world while Melkor was in captivity. And this is basically the world that the, the Noldor are showing up in out of nowhere. Right, so we rewind before the trees are even been taken down. Okay, In Middle-earth, Elway, or Thingol as we'll call him from now on, uh, he and Melian, his Maiar wife, are ruling over the Sindar which are pretty much all the elves that came west but never made it to Valinor. Although they were all but Thingol Mora Quendi, which means they never saw the light of the two trees in bloom, under the lordship of Thingol and the teaching of Melian, they became the fairest and the most wise and skillful of all the elves of Middle-earth. While Melkor was subdued and there was peace, Melian gave birth to her and Thingol's only child. Her name was Luthien, and when she was born, the white flowers of Nifrindil came forth to greet her as the stars from the earth, which... I guess is awesome? I don't really know. She was born and flowers bloomed. Way to go. <laughs> All right. So uh, also in this time of peace, the dwarves made their way across the Blue Mountains into Beleriand. The dwarves called themselves Khazad, but since the elves are racist, they call them the Naugrim, which means the stunted people. How mean is that? When the dwarves showed up and they're like, yeah, we're called the Khazad, they're like, mm, whatever, you're the Naugrim, look at you. <laughs> Seems kind of mean to me, and I feel it's kind of racist. And I could see why they would have cool relations after that. So uh, the elves were filled in amazement to discover another speaking race. Though they, they called them the Gonorim, too. I just realized that. That's, oh, yeah, that's yeah. some other Mastered. connotations. The <laughs> You're stunted <laughs> and you've got STDs. <laughs> <laughs> the elves were filled with amazement to discover another speaking race, though they found the dwarven speech to be cumbrous and unlovely. So most of the dwarves just learned to speak the elven tongue, which was cool with them because they didn't want to share their shit anyway. And uh, Thingol welcomed him with open arms. It's like, come, the little stunted people. Come to me. <laughs> the uh, dwarves built trade routes between them, and the elves and the dwarves both profited from this. Though in the end, the dwarves would end up liking the Noldor more because of their closeness to Aule, their maker. So Melian had the foresight to tell Thingol, hey, uh, look, there's probably not going to be such peaceful area to live in after a while, so we should probably do something about this place we live in. So we decided to build a stronghold. And he commissioned the dwarves to help with the building. And uh, Melian paid them with knowledge and Thingol with pearls from Curden that he had uh, plucked from the sea. The dwarves delved them, them halls in a rocky hill in the midst of the forest by the flowing of the river Esgaldun. Esgaldun? Esgaldun. Esgaldun. Look at you. You're way better than me. <laughs> So the dwelling was vast, great, and given the name Menengroth, which means Thousand Caves. Do we the, know uh, where Menengroth is now? Or uh, not now, but like in the time of the Middle Earth? It's gone. Or, I mean, is it gone? Okay. Lord of the Rings, I mean. It's gone. You'll find out why later on. Okay. So uh, the, the dwarves didn't do it by themselves. The elves had their part. And uh, I'm going to just read this passage because I like it. They wrought out of the visions of Melian, images of the wonder and beauty of Valinor beyond the sea. The pillars of Menograph were hewn in the likeness of the beaches of Orome, stock, bow, and leaf, and they were lit with lanterns of gold. The nightingales sang there, as in the gardens of Lorien, and there, and there were fountains of silver and basins of marble, the floors of many-colored stones. Carven figures of beasts and birds there ran upon the walls, or climbed upon the pillars, or peered among the branches entwined with many flowers. And as the years passed, Melian and her maidens filled the halls with woven hangings wherein could be read the deeds of the Valar and the many things that had befallen artists since the beginning, and the shadow of the things that were yet to come. That was the fairest dwelling of any any king that has ever been east of the sea. So basically is the nicest place the elves ever created. Yeah, this is one of the pl- – I mean there's a couple places throughout the books that I can picture really well, and he does these really beautiful descriptions. And I would definitely like to uh, to hang out at Menegroth for a couple endless centuries and, <laughs> and take in the, the lovely architecture. But it's weird and- that like the, the elves have this sort of love – this like cool you know relationship with the dwarves, but basically the dwarves built this amazing place for them. Right. Yeah, they, they dug, were, it, out the, yeah, they I mean, dug it out of the mountains. <laughs> right. <laughs> the elves hung the drapes. Yes. Basically, it sounds like it. They <laughs> carved did, the stone. To decorate. <laughs> yeah, the dwarves, they just, they're so cool to the elves, and bad things happen to them. It makes me sad. It's weird that the elves live in caves to me. I don't know why. Like, obviously, they did in The Hobbit, but it's just strange. Like, when I picture elves, I picture them being in the forest and just running around. But Menengroth is built in caves. Well, I, I picture them working, like, the trees into it, and there's it's it's not just, like, this dark 
you know, I think it's like Rivendell, but <laughs> but caves. Well, I kind of picture <laughs> I think they did a pretty good job in uh, the last Hobbit movie, the Desolation of Smog. Um, yeah, and the woodland realm of yeah, the way they incorporate is, the is, trees into yeah. the caves and stuff. And these are yeah. basically all part of the same. You know, the the elves of Mirkwood are the descendants, or they were part of the same people of of Thingol at right. some point. Yeah. They, they actually that place is actually built in memory of this place. Mm, interesting. No. It is. No. Well, that's a debate because they say it, it, the first sundering, like we were led to believe that those elves that went south, that that's where they went was to Mirkwood, and this place hadn't been built yet. Um, I'm pretty sure that it's built in the memory of this because I think the guy that ran that was from here. Thranduil? Thranduil, yes. He he's actually lived there. I mean, they don't mention in this. Sorry, somewhere. Thranduil. There we go. <laughs> <are>. Eyebrows. <laughs> yeah, but Irothingle got killed. I don't um, know. I don't know. A, a spoiler there, son? What are you doing? Oh, sorry. Sir, uh, spoiler. <laughs> well, anyone who looks at a map of Middle Earth will notice that it kind of ends at the Blue Mountains, and all this is past the Blue Mountains. So people with a critical eye will know that something's going down to all this land at some point. And we're going to assume whoever's not in the Lord of the Rings, they probably got killed or they left Middle Earth. <laughs> So. True enough. If they're an elf and they're not in Lord of the Rings, they died. Like, how does Curden just stand there forever? And grow a beard. Yes, yeah, he, he grew a beard. a beard. Which, they never specifically say that no elves have beards. It's just, I don't know, it's weird that that one elf, he points out the fact that he does have a beard. Well, he's mm-hmm. the oldest elf we meet. Like, he's literally, what he's other elves? He's November. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> aside from Galadriel, we really, in Lord of the Rings, there's no elves from the begin from that awoke at Quivien and then he's supposed to be one of them, right? Uh, he could be one of them, yes. Right. He was he no, was at Quivien at one, one point. I don't know if he was one of the originals that woke there, but he was from there. Yeah. So he's we- older than Treebeard. I thought Treebeard was the oldest thing on Middle Earth. And he's got a beard. His name is Treebeard. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Maybe the elves just like to shave, and he was like, "I'm not shaving." <laughs> <laughs> he grew mustache. He was like, "Come on, guys, let's go over this <laughs> over the seat." Come on. All right, let's talk about Curden when he actually shows up because he's not he's not in this <laughs> okay. chapter yet. <laughs> All right. So um well, interesting we're talking about the sea. It's like the dwarves they never went to the sea and they feared to look upon it. Why do you think do you think it's because they're like were made from stone and they can't swim, they just sink to the bottom? <laughs> yeah, I'm that's, sure that's That's it. my little theory. That's my little theory. Yeah. <laughs> You can shoot it down if you want. Well, I think it's because the elves awoke by water. There's always this mythical association of like peace and and being and communing with the gods between the elves. You know, even like when Legolas sees the sea for the first time, he, this amazing yearning comes over him and he sings his lovely song. But the, they say like the first time the, the dwarves saw the sea or the, heard the sea, they were they were scared of it because they were created by Aule, who's got nothing to do with water. He's stone and mountain and creation, and that's their thing. So it's they just don't have the same connection to it that the elves do. But do you think if Almo blew his horn, they'd be like, oh, the sea, I love it. That's what he did to the elves, because they were scared at first, too. And then he blew his horn, and they were like, yeah, now we want to go west real bad. It does say anyone who hears those horns will love the sea and never forget, so I'd say they, they would, but it just hasn't happened yet. Yeah, he, he didn't give a shit about that. <laughs> All right, so uh, the dwarves warned the elves that Melkor's minions were starting to stir again in Middle-earth, and that their kin in the far east were flying from the plains to, to the hills, which, are we to believe the elves have wings? Yeah. No. Yeah? <laughs> so, uh... Get to the battle. <laughs> <laughs> Calm down. Also, some baddies were returning from over the mountains, uh, like some wolves or what they thought were wolves, shadows and orcs and all sorts of things. So Thingol took a, took thought for arms, which his people had never needed before. He looked to the dwarves, for they were a warlike race. They had been battling for a long time against anyone who agreed them, including other dwarves. The Valar never came to protect them. So... The Sindar learned from the dwarves to create weapons and armor and filled their armories for the darkness to come. Some more elves showed up because they heard Thingol had a cool-ass kingdom. And uh, the uh, time of Melian was just at its noontime, so she had all this power. So the darkness came to Valinor and Melkor Melkor slew the great trees and returned once again to Middle-earth. Only the power of Melian kept Ungolian in check from her flight from the servants of Melkor. And Melkor retook his stronghold in Angband, just 50 leagues from the gates of Menengroth, far and yet all too near. Which, it doesn't really seem like it's that far away to me. Yeah, they say it's 150 leagues, which, you know, the, the league isn't a nec- it, there's different definitions of a league, but it's basically 87 miles around there, which seems super close. Yeah. So I think well, it's actually further than that. It's <laughs> not even on the map in the book, like it's cut off before 
Ang band. Maybe leagues yeah, are just a general term. It definitely has like a mountain range in between them anyway. <laughs> so uh, Melkor sent forth his orcs filled with lust of lust of ruin and death to assault the elves. They got forces in the lands between Thingol and Menegroth and Curden at Eglarest. And uh, Thingol decided, I'm going to attack these bitches. So him and Denethor attacked the orcs from both sides. And uh, the poor orcs that didn't get massacred between them uh, went north and got waylaid by the dwarves and their sharp steel axes. Poor, poor orcs. They just didn't even see it coming. <laughs> and few indeed returned to Angband. But the victory was dearly bought, for Denethor and his followers were cut off, surrounded, and killed before Thingol could come to the, their aid. Denethor's people never took another king and never went to open war again and kind of just became peaceful little farmers. And also, Curtin's forces were driven to the rim of the sea. So Thingol then withdrew all his forces into the, fastne- the vastness of Neldoreth and Regian. And Melian put forth her power and fenced all that dominion round with an unseen wall of shadow and bewilderment called the Girdle of Melian. None thereafter could pass against her will or the will of the king, unless one should come with greater power than Melian, the Maiar. This land was then called Doriath, the guarded kingdom, the land of the girdle. Within there was the, a watchful peace, but peril and great fear without, and all the servants of Morgoth roamed at will. But new tidings were at hand, unseen by Morgoth or Melian, and this time Feanor came over the sea just and just burned the white ships of the Teleri. Yeah, so the, the girdle of Melian, I, we're led to believe that that's kind of the same thing that Galadriel kind of puts around um, Lorien in Lord of the Rings. This, you know, net that keeps, you know, keeps the bad guys out and only people who she wants in can come in. Right, you just go in and you get all confused and turned around and ended up walking out again. <laughs> right. <laughs> what was I doing again? Um... <laughs> But also, it's good to keep in mind also, this is the battle between the elves and the orcs and the dwarves. This is considered the first battle of the Wars of Beleriand, and there will be several more going forward. And uh, the first time I read this, I actually had a little cheat sheet where I was writing down the different battles, and I, I tried to find it, but I couldn't. But this is the this is basically the beginning of the official Wars of Beleriand. It's pretty minor compared to what comes later, but it is important that Denethor was killed. And Cairdan and his people are basically besieged now in the Eglarist. It's strange that the elves kind of did the same thing as the Valar. They just pulled in and then wait. <laughs> Guard their borders. Yeah, I mean, they don't really send out any... Or do they? <laughs> well, that's basically what they've done there. I mean, maybe it's because Melian's like, this is what I would do if I were you, because she's a Maiar, and that's what Maiar do. <laughs> well, I think they're kind of regrouping too, right? Because this is the first battle. They're like, what the shit's going on? we got to protect ourselves. Okay, let's settle down. Get the shit settled, and then, you know, I don't know what happens next, but, you know, maybe they'll go on the offensive or get some kind of strategy. Yeah, like, hey, Melian, maybe you could make us a magical invisible fence so none of them could get in here. And she's like, <laughs> fucking done. And we also meet, um, we're, we're told that the dwarves are actually the best, uh, like, swordsmiths, even better than the elves. And the, they there's very few dwarves that are actually named in the Silmarillion, and there might only be a couple, but Telkar is uh, is named here, and he's the, the smith with was greatest in renown. He actually is believed to be the guy who actually forged the um, Narsil, the sword of uh, that Aragorn has in Lord of the Rings. The only reason why I leave stuff like that out is because it's like, do people listening really need another name oh, that no, will never come up again? <laughs> I, it's also Telkar. It doesn't he, sound like a dwarf. It sounds like an elf. I, I don't know. When is he supposed to have done made Narsil? Because Narsil couldn't be a dwarf sword. That thing's like six feet tall. Well, well it was he made, one, it, he for made it for the elves. Oh, okay. But it wasn't, uh, it doesn't look like a Elvish blade, but I guess if you a dwarf. I'm going off the movie, if my idea of the movie <laughs> yeah, sword, too. It's not curved and flowery. Right. But okay. <laughs> right, it's like a broadsword. Yeah. That seems dwarvish to me. <laughs> they didn't all use axes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the wars are, you know, have begun in earnest. There's kind of like a watchful, not peace, but the lines have been drawn, and now the all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you know, Feanor and Fingolfin, all these these elves are showing up, been away for thousands of years. Nevaya, <laughs> 
And now we get to chapter 11, uh, which is of the sun and moon and the hiding of Valinor. And I've got the recap for this one. After Melkor and Ungoliant destroy the two trees, the Valar, they meet in the Ring of Doom to plan their response. Um, we also find out here that they never really speak. They just take counsel with using their kind of mental powers, which is pretty cool. The Valar mourn for Feanor also, since he was the mightiest of the living elves in beauty, understanding, skill, and strength. And I don't think this can possibly be true, because he's definitely not the best in understanding. <laughs> <laughs> messengers arrive in Valinor with Feanor. Or's response to the Valar's offer to return, Manwe weeps, and uh, at this, int- and Mandos tells the Valar that Feanor, Feanor will come to him soon. Uh, Yavanna and Nienna then put forth all their powers in an attempt to bring the trees back to life. They're unsuccessful, but Telparion bears one final flower, and Laurelin bears one single fruit, and then they die completely. These were then given to Ali, who made great vessels to put them in, and Manwe hallowed them, and Varda placed them in the sky, on, and they set them on their appointed paths. The moon, who's known as Isil, was made from the flower of Telperion, and the sun, which was called Arian, was made from the fruit of Laurelin. And now we get this weird pseudo-scientific explanation of how the sun and moon started, and I was completely confused the first time I read it, because it seems like they start going west to east, and then they stop, and then they redo it. But I really wish we didn't get any of this, it was just, they went up in the sky, and that's the sun and moon, because it just, it makes it, since we know what the sun and moon actually are, like, do you guys think does it make sense? I wish, because there's no science here at all. It's all it's very mythological and magical, and it just took me out of it almost a little bit. I think this is actually one of the things that he wishes he didn't write, but he couldn't think of a better way to do it. Like I don't think Tolkien wrote this. I think Tolkien probably specifically didn't write it. And no, he did. Oh, he did. He did. He did write this. Okay. I I just remember the Tolkien professor talking about it all right. and how he wishes he had. He couldn't come up with a better way to do it, and he just decided, well, it's a fantasy world. But, you know, he didn't actually publish this, so maybe he would have changed it in the end. Because, like, the the moon eventually, you know, starts to chase the sun because it wants to be close to it, but it gets burned. So then they have to separate them and and set them on separate paths. So basically they're only in the sky at the same time very rarely. Um, So so the sun and moon are finally starting. Uh, Morgoth hates the the light of the sun, and he delves his fortress of Angban even deeper, and he sends up a great smoke above the mountains of Thangorodrim, which is another one of my favorite favorite words from this, um, to block out the sun. And then Morgoth uh, attacks the moon because he hates it, um, but he's unsuccessful. His spirits are beaten back by uh, by the by the moon and its its servants. Okay. Which right there um, makes me think that you know Balrogs. It, it doesn't specifically say it was Balrogs here, but they could have had wings because you can't get to the moon without <laughs> some kind of flight. They were his spirits. Yeah. Well, we know they definitely have wings. It's just that they might be vestigial, right? Isn't that the the debate? Or oh, they're wreathed well, in no, shadow? Because they yeah. say like it sends out its shadow as if wings or something like that. It's it's very convoluted and people don't. Yeah, but every you know, illustration I've seen, they've all got wings. And the one in the Lord of the Rings movies is awesome. So I don't see why we don't just call that. <laughs> <He's canon>. complaining. <laughs> mm. So uh, that's why he sent them farther, right? Because they were attacked. Uh, the moon. That's why they sent them farther out. Because see, Morgoth I don't know if they were really closer. I know that they separated them and they set them on like separate paths. But I didn't get. But I, I, I was. I took it as Morgoth attacked them and was, you know, freaked out and, and scurried back. So I didn't know. But maybe they moved them a little higher up and yeah. in, into the firmament. The whole <laughs> part of them, when they go under is like very vague and nonsensical. Well, there's nothing nonsensical about the, almost people taking it and shuffling it under the, the disc world and then popping it up along the other side. There's nothing. There's nothing weird about that. No. <laughs> the Earth isn't round yet. Just get over it. <laughs> I know science. Um, right. I mean, I mean, I think we had this conversation on the forums that it's just a pancake world before the uh, before all worlds were bent. Right. You just have to stop trying to. Comp- trying to fit it into what we know as science and you know just keep it's it. not a creation myth for earth <laughs> right yeah. although well that's what he was trying to do for england at least but he gave up <laughs> because he realized it's not but the constellations are all the same i think it's the book of lost tales that actually has one of his earliest illustrations was he drew like a viking longship and he drew it as if that was the earth and there was the the water underneath and there was the sky was in the sail it was this really weird i don't know if anyone else has seen that illustration i think it's in the book of lost tales but it, it kind of is like this is that was his earliest thinking of the world was it, it was a ship we also are told here that as morgoth creates more evil things or the more evil of himself that he puts into his creations i don't think he becomes less powerful but they say he's bound more to the earth the more he 
does. And I think this is why he never really changes his form after this, because ever since he does his exchange with Ungoliant, he never changes his form. He's always a Dark Lord, terrible to behold. Where when he with was burnt going, hands. yeah, with burnt with burnt hands, the gonorrhea uh, hands. <laughs> Uh, so the Valar, they know they're not ready yet to attack Morgoth in force, so they decide to fortify the land of Ammon from any future attack from Morgoth. They raise the Pelori Mountains ever even higher. They make the cliffs sheer so no one can climb over them. Uh, they set a guard at the pass in the mountains. And they also set up the Enchanted Isles around Tol Arisea, so anybody who's sailing to Valinor will become lost and, and, and crash upon these islands and then fall asleep and live there forever. Which seems kind of cruel, but I get what they're doing. Um, <laughs> Is it explained how the elves, like in the Third Age, get there? Like, are they given a pass? Like, okay, you can come. That all gets explained later when the world okay. changes. Yeah, but it does end with this kind of cryptic uh, passage. Yeah, because right now the world is a pancake, right? <laughs> but we don't have to use such crude terms as pancake world when we're talking about <laughs> the Silmarillion. But yes, it's a pancake. <laughs> no, it's more like a flapjack, hot cake, regional, regional. It's like a waffle, really. <laughs> <laughs> There it's are... just flat. <laughs> All right. So it ends where they're saying that the doom of Mandos, Mandos was fulfilled, where he said that the um, that the land of Ammon would be shut against the Noldor. Thus it was that as Mandos foretold to them in Aramon, the Blessed Realm was shut against the Noldor. And of the many messengers that in after days sailed into the west, none came ever to Valinor, save only one, the mightiest mariner of song. So it's another mention of someone who we're not going to meet for another 200 pages, but keep that in mind. It'll, it'll show up. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I wonder why they even he even puts that in there. It's neat, but it's like, why'd you even mention that? He's that, a troll. Oh, no one ever came back until this Should one guy. I just flip 200 pages. <laughs> <laughs> well, critical readers of Lord of the Rings will probably remember the three-page song that is sung at some point. It might have been at a uh, in in Rivendell, I think, of Eärendil and his voyage. So maybe it's just he's trying to see who's paying attention. Oh, maybe. Yeah, but that was made up by Bilbo Baggins. And he was a hobbit, and it's not an elf. Yes, <laughs> but he's obsessed with elf culture, and he loved getting getting access to the books. And they talked about, I don't know if I heard about this somewhere, I guess. It was actually, this is the book that Bilbo read to make that, or something like that. The Silmarillion? Yeah, like, yeah. this is supposed to be that book. He read it in, uh, in, in what's that called? Rivendell? Rivendell. 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 Yeah. I mean, he also got, obviously, probably some first-hand accounts, but... Uh, <laughs> But they said, like, the book that he passes on to Bilbo was supposed to be the Silmarillion, mm-hmm. or Frodo. Anyway, go ahead, no, sorry. Uh, no, because they make a, a statement in that book that it's like, oh, how can we tell between a hobbit and mortal? Because all mortals are the same thing. I'm pretty sure Sh- Shellfish said something like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sheep between sheep. No, like they get, he gave Frodo like a book of elvish tales, and this is supposed to be that book, like hypothetically. Right, but there's the other book, the Red Book of Westmarch, which is the yeah, book – that's a different book then, right? R- that was no, the that's one that his was, own tale. Right. That's right? his tale, but that's right. The, that, he, that he gives Frodo that book also that he's writing. But he gave him another book of elvish tales, which was supposed to be this book in Tolkien's little – yeah. Narrative. Well, also, we're ref- they reference uh, three or four books in here, like, you know, as is told previously in the book of so-and-so, written by so-and-so, but that book's so famous that I'm not going to mention it here. You know, it's it's more of that, <laughs> you know, and Bilbo's got access to these books in, 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 uh, now in Valinor, because he gets to go back to Valinor. And Bilbo's dead. No, Bilbo lives forever. Bilbo lives. Oh, so, like, the world of Ice and Fire? Oh, no, no, sorry. You're like, they just, uh, they just reference a lot of other maesters. Oh, yeah. Right, in yeah. The book. Mm-hmm. So, oh, okay, I get you now. <laughs> no spoilers. I didn't want to spend too much on, on the di- on the different stages of the Sun and the Moon, but it's basically they got their stuff worked out and now they're they work the way we that they work in our world. Kinda, yeah. cuz not really. I don't know if you know this Greg, but the Sun is like the center of our our little solar system and we actually pass around the Sun. Blasphemy. <laughs> <laughs> Propaganda. But thus began the uh counting of days. Right. Yes, the, the sun rise and fall in day. Mm-hmm. So now we so can that, say this day and this one yeah. night instead of this one time. Yeah, it kind of blew my mind when I was reading it because so everything that's happened before it's kind of like the picture on the cover of my book, the second edition is uh, I guess the Eldar, like it looks like it's really early morning. It's like real it's twilight. It's not bright at all. It's just the light from the stars and the light from the far-off tree. 
and there was no weeks or days. It was just all kind of happening. Well, there was the short time that they had the two lamps where they could uh, yeah. like mingle, but that was relatively short. But and that was before the elves were around. But yeah, it's yeah. been in, ever since the since the, those were destroyed. Middle Earth was in twilight, but Valinor had the light of the trees. Right. And they kind of like get like time pass according to the trees at that point. But then the trees died, and they're like, "Man, we need something else. Let's throw a fireball in the sky." Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So now we come to our final chapter of Men, and Shane has agreed to uh, do overtime for this one, and he'll be doing the recap. Chapter 12 of Men. Yeah, when I agreed to do this, I said, this is two pages. <laughs> but I forgot these were Tolkien pages. <laughs> so. Just read the, the two pages. <laughs> uh, more or less, but here. Uh, so the Valar chill out after giving light to Middle Earth. Morgoth is uncontested, save for the valor of the Noldar, uh, but Olmo, Olmo kept up on current events. I'm going to read the chapter here, or this passage. From this time forth were reckoned the years of the sun. Swifter and briefer are they than the long years of the trees in Valinor. In that time the air of Middle-earth became heavy with the breath of growth and mortality, and the changing and aging of all things was hastened exceedingly. Life teemed upon the soil and in the waters... And in the second spring of Arda, and the Eldar increased, and beneath the sun, Beleriand grew green and fair. So basically, this is when Middle-earth becomes the way it is more or less as we know it. Yeah, like everything was on pause in the sleep of Yavanna up until this point, and now that the sun's up to uh, to wake up the, you know, the creatures and the trees, and now everything's like a regular world, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, like Shane said last uh, episode, green was created. <laughs> Let's go with that. <laughs> <laughs> At the first rising of the sun, men awoke in Hildarion, in the east. The sun rose in the west, because that's the way it started. Yep. <laughs> and men moved toward it. The Eldar called men the Atani, or second people, and the Hildar, which means followers, and the Apananor, which means the afterborn, which is kind of gross. It sounds like afterbirth. The Inglar. Oh, damn it. <laughs> I'm sure they go with the Apananor more than we're the afterborn. <laughs> Yeah, Ingwar, which is sickly, Firamar, the mortals, and also they called them the usurpers, the strangers, the inscrutable, the self-cursed, the heavy-handed, the night fears, and the children of the sun. Why are the elves such dicks? <laughs> they have <laughs> all these the slang aborted. terms, like, right away. It's like, this is what we're going to call you. You now. stunted people. You sickly. <laughs> <laughs> They're so mean. Little is told of men here, except for the Anatanatari who went north. No Valar came to guide men, so men feared them. It's kind of douchey on the, Val- on the Valar, right? Well, they kind like, of fucked it up with the elves. Well, I guess you don't really know that yet. But. <laughs> well, it's not up to the Valar. It's up to... Right? Uh, Eru? Like, that's... Well, it's just kind of shitty. They're like, the second they're, coming. They're, the like, second they're coming. like the second kid, you know? You get no attention. Uh, Almo gives him some attention later on. Yeah, he kept them in his thoughts, and he sent them messages. So they loved to see, but they did not understand it, because they really didn't understand his messages. <laughs> Men eventually hooked up with some dark elves, and they learned from them a lot of things. And those aren't evil elves. They're just... Right. They're, they're called just dark elves. elves. Never, <laughs> never went and knew the Valar. Never learned from the Valar. they just been tilt- twiddling around on Middle-earth. The light of the sun kept Morgoth at bay in these times, because it was new and it, he feared it, and many works of Yvonne now bloomed and grew. Men spread west, north, and south. This time passed, and there came a time of war between Morgoth uh, and the Sindar and Noldar and men. In those days, elves and men were of like stature and strength of body, but the elves had greater wisdom and skill and beauty, and those who had dwelt in Valinor and looked upon the powers as much surpassed the dark elves in these things as they in turn surpassed the people of mortal race. So basically, there's power levels. There's the elves that saw the tree that hung out with the Valar that are super powerful. And then there's the elves that hung out with Melian that are just a step below them. And then there's the dark elves that didn't see shit and just kind of figured out their own stuff. And then there's men. uh, There's uh, Thingol that held up with uh, Melian that actually saw the trees. The Noldor were greater than the Sindar. The Sindar were greater than men. And we get uh, here contradictory information. 
um, which I'm going to read from here. Immortal were the elves, and their wisdom waxed from age to age, and no sickness or pestilence brought death to them. Their bodies, indeed, were of the stuff of earth and could be destroyed, and in those days they were more like to the bodies of men, since they had not so long been inhabited by the fire of their spirit, which consumes them from within in the courses of time. But men were more frail, more easily slain by weapon or mischance, and less easily healed, subject to sickness and many ills, and they grew old and died. So it seems like that men and, and elves were very similar, but then they say at the same time that they're very different. Well, that's why I, the whole point of your thing is, is like something that was made up to differentiate them, but we're pretty much it's spelled out for us that they're physic they look physically the same. They just they're they have different attributes. Like uh, and the elves are more wise. beautiful. Yeah, because they've got the light of Ammon in their eyes and everything. I mean, if you saw an elf and a man, I don't know if you'd be able to tell them apart unless you said, "Hey, how old are you? Oh, I'm twenty. And oh, hey, how old are you? I'm I'm seven thousand six hundred years old. Oh, you're the elf." <laughs> 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 Men's fate after death is unknown. Baron returned from the mansions of the dead, but he never spoke afterward to mortal men. Do we meet Baron yet, or are we going to meet Baron? You're going to meet Baron. Nah, you're going to meet okay. Baron. It's another weird name drop of the things yet to come. <laughs> and you get another big one in the next paragraph. And then we are told how things will eventually be by the time, like, the Third Age. But then this time, men and elves are allies, and some men were great and valiant captains of the Noldor. Oh, yeah, they were. <laughs> Very briefly. <laughs> and in the glory and beauty of the elves, and in their fate, full share had the offspring of elf and mortal, Erendil and Elwing, and Elrond their child. So, Elrond is the child of Erendil and Elwing, is that what they're saying? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Yeah, pretty much. We don't know who they are yet. <laughs> <laughs> and that's chapter 12 of Men. Glad um, the action's picking up. Yeah, it's, there's going to be a lot of action going forward. Oh, yeah. like, that's why I've, I feel that you know so many people are turned off by the, the whole build-up in the beginning and the creation, but once it does start, it really is. There, there's a lot going on. And once once Hopefully. once the Noldor get back and they're, you know, the war start, it's it's just it's just tragedy after tragedy, but it's fun to read about. <laughs> the problem is time. Like, right now, time is flying by. Like, you just can't even comprehend how many years have gone by just in the time of the trees. And, like, as the well, book they, goes on, they don't even have in. time. Well, they have right. a measure of time, but we don't have a we don't know because like, like they don't have time until the sun and moon come up, right? Kind of, but yeah, but they call them like there's Melkor was chained for three ages. Now, if that's true, then the third age it, it's a different kind of ages, but the first, the second, and the third age happen after that. Right. The time that Melkor was chained is the same amount of time that everything else happens after the trees are destroyed. I still just can't believe how how condescending the elves are. <laughs> really? They, they meet the, the dwarves and they just like immediately start picking on them. And then they meet the men and they immediately start picking on them. And they wonder why these people are cool toward them. I guess the men fall right in love with them, but the yeah, dwarves but are kind think, of... Think of them because... Like if you met another being that wasn't immortal, that was weaker, you know, they would you would look down. I think you would look down. They're they they think they're a different species. They're not their equals. That, well, they are a different species. I know, but if you don't, <laughs> like, another thing. There's nothing like, comparable to like if all of a sudden ants started talking, yeah, and be like, hey, we're here and we'd like to learn from you. You'd be like, ugh, get a little. I don't know. Maybe that was a. Bad and they comparison. are basically like God's <laughs> chosen children. You know, they were taken to the land of the gods and taught by the gods. And these men are just on Middle Earth and are not taught anything. I mean, ooh, don't talk about chosen people. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, I mean, it would seem that way to them. Yeah, but uh... well, they're the firstborn, and you can't help but feel special. I mean, Fanor is the firstborn; he's born, and he's he feels special. <laughs> and the fact yeah, that they yeah, but Fanor's a dick. <laughs> we we. Know. I mean, <laughs> I I think we all assume that. <laughs> Well, the fact that they have, like, a quasi-immortality is really what puts them on edge, like, gives them an edge over men and dwarves. I mean, a man and a dwarf can only do so much in their lifetimes, whereas elves can just, you'd think, could do a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah but at the same time, they grow tired, and that's their whole thing. Like, they and, grow tired of the earth. And they dwindle. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> like this podcast, they dwindle. <laughs> Okay, then we've got our end. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone for joining us for our third one. Um, next week we will be getting into some divisions of Bel uh, Beleriand, and we'll be meeting some really pissy elves. And uh, yeah, some more more fun stuff will go down. But I hope you're enjoying it, and uh, you can join us next time. All right, until All right. next time. Bye bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. Is that her vagina? 
I, I don't think so. <laughs> It's it's almost like you know how Ivana was involved in the Sumerals that the Omo and and uh, and the the the, the um the lesser I'll say I'll say and Nef... no what's it what's the other one Vi <laughs> <laughs> uh, no <laughs> what's this there's the two of them the I'll wounded? say Ome and. Who's Olme? Tell me who's Olme. <laughs> no, was it was it Ase and Uinen? Uinen, there we go. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Okay, yeah, they helped. Oh, of it. course you were. <laughs> <laughs> Is that her vagina? I, I don't think so. <laughs> right, they all dwindle, but dwindle the elf. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it! Wasn't that your fucking like horror episode where Gwendiel was a dwarf? <laughs> Wait, what? No, he, Brett mentioned how elves dwindle last episode, and I pictured a little elf named Dwindle, like Dwindle. Oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, oh, good. It just seems like an elf name, not an elven name, like a little elf. <laughs> Sorry to derail it. Continue. <laughs> Is that her vagina? Mm. I, I don't think so. <laughs> this time passed over. This time. All right, I'm reading here. I was scribbling it fast when I was writing this. No <laughs> Greg, does it frustrate you that you're the only one that can read out of the four of us? <laughs> well, I have been reading these passages out loud for the last week to myself to make them sound so perfect, but no, it's fine. <laughs> oh, so we're not prepared. Damn it. Is that her vagina? I, I don't think so. <laughs> Man, I always feel like I write too much. I got like two and a half pages. It's I tough. got a page and a half on my two-page of men chapter. Well, you could just say men show up. That's, and that's... <laughs> if it was a normal author, I could, but now with Tolkien. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird because I like I want to make it like so every paragraph is like a sentence, and then I end up writing a paragraph <laughs> for every paragraph. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've got some passages to read in my summaries too. Some of it's like there's no point in summarizing. I mean, it's like so great what it's <laughs> there on the page. I know. I was right. taking notes at the bookstore. It was it was really slow, and I had this, and I was like taking notes. And someone came and was like, "Oh, are you are you taking a class?" I was like, "Do I just say yes as the simple answer and close the book?" <laughs> but I decided to attempt to explain what we're doing. They're like, "Oh, that's cool. Now, can I please buy my Nora Roberts book?" 